Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, take our Bibles this morning and open them to Genesis chapter 38 and verse 1. Um, the title of our message this morning is Our Kinsman Redeemer. And as you're turning there, Ed, uh, in the announcements, mentioned that our Prophecy Conference is coming up. Um, well, really, Friday, Saturday. And there's a banquet Friday evening at nearby Sugar Country Club that has been sold out for a while, but I just received word that there have been some cancellations. So if you want to come to the banquet, um, now's your opportunity to take advantage of that. You could probably, let me think here, either sign up on the church website, and if that doesn't work, uh, call the church office and we'll get you signed up. And our Saturday, all day Saturday conference is almost sold out. I think there's like six places left. So if you want to come Saturday, now's the time to, you know, get your place reserved. Um, probably call the church office to get in on that. And then next Sunday is just a normal church service. The conference will be over. You don't have to register to come to church. <laughs> but we're going to have some of the speakers from the conference still here presenting. So in the Sunday School Hour, Olivier Melnick is going to be teaching on Jewish evangelism. I think the title of his session is, I have a Jewish friend, now what? And then uh, <laughs> Dr. David Reagan is going to be in the pulpit um, next Sunday during our normal worship service time. And he's uh, going to be giving a message that I actually asked him to bring. It's called America's Destiny. And um, get your seatbelts fastened fasten for that one. What's that? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. Um, and then upstairs with the youth group, Russ Miller is going to be with the youth dealing with Noah's Ark, dinosaurs, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so um, he's going to be up there dealing with those type of apologetic creationist type questions. So if you have youth or children or grandchildren that are wrestling with these issues, um, next Sunday would be a great time to bring them. And then our music Sunday morning, just like in the conference, is going to be handled by Lev Shello. Uh, Bruce is going to be absent because he's got to go to the National Religious Broadcasters meeting. So Lev Shello is going to be doing our music uh, in the regular church service, um, just like they're going to be handling it for us at the conference. Um, their music style is more of the contemporary variety. And it's more of a kind of an upbeat Hebraic messianic flavor. So we've had them before and enjoyed them. So I just wanted to let you know those um, uh, changes, not permanent changes, but changes next Sunday will be, will be coming. But for the time being, let's turn our attention to the book of Genesis. And the title of our message this morning is Our Kinsman Redeemer. As we have been uh, working our way through the book of Genesis, we have seen that God in the book of Genesis is raising up a very special nation, the nation of Israel. He's done that through the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now he is in the business of raising up Joseph, who will be the instrument that God will use to preserve Israel. Well, why does Israel need to be preserved? Why do they need to be taken from Canaan to Egypt to be preserved for 400 years? Well, Genesis 38, as strange as a chapter as it is, explains that. So Genesis 38 picks up where Genesis 37 ends. 
So you've got to come to Sugarland Bible Church to learn all that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> chapter 37 is the story of Joseph, his coat, his dreams, his pit, and then his enslavement down into Egypt. We've studied that. But why is God doing this? Genesis 38 answers that. Genesis 38 is sort of the explanation of what would have happened to God's elect nation, Israel, had they left them in Canaan. And so we can take Genesis 38 and divide it into three parts. Um, There's Tamar and Judah's sons, verses 1 through 11. That's probably as far as we'll get today. Then there's the story of Tamar and Judah, middle of the chapter. And then there's the story of Tamar and Judah's twins, one of which is in the line leading to Jesus. And so although this is kind of an odd chapter, a strange chapter, sort of a startling chapter, a graphic chapter, uh, as we'll see even today, it it's, it's very significant that this chapter is in our Bible because it's the explanation as to why God is moving Israel temporarily for 400 years. The Joseph story is what is happening. Genesis 38 is why it is happening. And so notice, if you will, as we try to embark today on verses 1 through 11, Tamar and Judah's sons. We have, first of all, Judah's separation from the rest of his family, verse 1. We have timing, and we have an event. Notice verse 1. It says, now it came about at that time. What time? The same time period that God allowed Joseph to be sold as a slave down into Egypt. As that was happening, Judah one of Jacob's sons leaves, goes somewhere else. The destination is given in the rest of verse one as Joseph is being sold as a slave. And so you can see very clearly here that you have a purpose behind Genesis chapter 38. Genesis 37 is what's happening. Genesis 38 is the purpose, why it's happening. And you see the timing, and then you also see the event that transpired. It says, at that time, or it came about at that time, as Joseph was being sold as a slave, that Judah, that's Jacob's fourth born son, departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. So Judah is leaving uh, Hebron. Uh, He's leaving what is called the hill country. And he goes and visits an Adulamite. Uh, What is an Adulamite? Well, an Adulamite is someone living in Adulam. (laughs) And this particular Adulamite is named Hira. Hira is a Canaanite. And so one of the things that we've been pointing out as we've been going through the book of Genesis is all of these places of geography. I mean, these are geophysical, real people and real places. And I bring this up a lot because a lot of people look at the Bible as just sort of the spiritual tales for the day. Not really telling you that the Bible actually comes out of a historical context that's extremely detailed and extremely credible. And so when you're reading the Bible, you're not just learning these kind of pie-in-the-sky spiritual lessons. You're actually reading a documented book of history. The places and the persons uh, can be validated. And so Judah now is separated from his brothers. And Judah, verse 2, is going to take a Canaanite wife. And there's the problem. The intermarriage of the Israelites with the Canaanites, which would have taken the nation of Israel and caused it to lose its distinctiveness had God left them in Canaan. This is why God is moving them out of Canaan, to keep them distinct. 
in a place called Goshen. And if God doesn't do this, you don't have a nation anymore. And if you don't have a distinct nation anymore, you don't have a Messiah coming from that nation. And so this is why God is doing what he's doing with this character, Genesis 37, named uh, Joseph. But notice, uh, if you will, verse two, it says, Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. There's the problem. Judah marries the daughter of Shua. He's intermarrying with the Canaanites. Now, this is something that God would later say when the nation of Israel would later enter Canaan under Joshua. It's an absolute no-no to intermarry with the Canaanites. God later in time would speak these words to the nation of Israel concerning the Canaanites. He's talking here, Deuteronomy 7, about the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Electric Lights, etc. And he says in verse 3, Deuteronomy chapter 7, furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn away, turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And of course, the application for us today is the concept of being unequally yoked. Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 16, says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among, among them, and they will be their God, and they shall be my people. As a Christian, those contemplating marriage should not marry a non-Christian. And if you want to know the consequences of people that have gone down that road, it's just a matter of talking to them. It's a difficult road to go down, because God says stay away from it. Because what will happen is you will be unequally yoked. A yoke is a harness that went over two animals in the ancient world and bound them together. And if the animals were unequally yoked, the stronger would influence the weaker. So we get ourselves into these sort of marital relationships many times because we think we're going to fix the other person. And God says, if you put yourself in that kind of situation, they are going to influence you more than you are going to influence them. So don't do it. You know, stay away from that. And in the time when the scripture was written concerning the nation of Israel, Israel was specifically told to not intermarry with the Canaanites because the Canaanites would negatively influence the Israelites. And had the Canaanites negatively influenced the Israelites early on, Israel would have lost its uniqueness, its exceptionalism as a nation. They would have just assimilated into the various people groups of Canaan, would have been no different from them, and that would have jeopardized the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why this concept of separation removing Israel from the situation through Joseph is happening because of the sin that Judah is committing here. Keep in mind that Judah is no lightweight. He is the fourth born, and through Judah is going to come the Messiah. That is going to be spoken a little later in the book of Genesis, in Genesis 49 verse 10. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the nations or the peoples. The Messiah, according to prophecy, is going to come through Judah's lineage. 
That's jeopardized if Judah starts to intermarry amongst the Canaanites. This is why Jesus, over and over again in the New Testament, we are told he is from the tribe of Judah. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5 says, One of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion is from the tribe of Judah. The root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. If you don't have a Messiah coming from Judah, you don't have anyone qualified to open the seven sealed scroll. In the book of Revelation, which will bring God's judgments to the earth and ultimately his kingdom. And so Judah's behavior here is jeopardizing all of that. And that's why God is raising up Joseph as his instrument to get his people out of Canaan, so this type of intermarrying doesn't keep happening. So this is largely a record of Judah's sins. He separates from his brothers, he takes a Canaanite wife, and from that Canaanite wife he has three sons, and those are described in verses three, four, and five. Notice verse 3, it says, So she conceived, that's Judah and his wife, she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Er. So the first son is named by Judah. He's named Er. Er, the best we can tell in Hebrew, is the word watcher. The second son is named Onan, and you see him described there in verse 4. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. It's kind of interesting that the second son, the first son is named by Judah. The second son is named by Judah's new Canaanite wife. And Onan's name means strength or it can also mean sorrow. And then there's a third son born through all of this and his name is Shelah. And if you look at verse 5, it says, Then he bore still another son and named him Shelah, and it was at Kezib that she bore him. So the third son is also named by his wife. Um, His name means actually weak. And the birthplace is a place called Kezib. Um, If your eyes are good, maybe you could see that, maybe you can't, but... It's a circle of the different geographical areas where all of these things that we're reading about in Genesis 38 are going to transpire. So it's interesting that at this point, Judah is no longer dwelling in Adullam. He's still in what we call uh, the Shephelah, which is a little bit different than the hill country where the rest of his brothers were. He's still separated from his brothers who are in the hill country, and he has these three sons. Now, it's interesting, this third son, Shelah, is the founder of a clan uh, later in time called the Shelanites. Uh, They're described in Numbers 26, verse 20. It says, the sons of Judah, according to their families, were of Shelah, the family of the Shelanites. So this particularly third son, seems to have a little bit more significance later on um, in the biblical record. Now, someone comes into the picture named uh, Tamar. And Tamar intermarries with these these sons, uh, the first two anyway. The first intermarriage between Tamar and one of these sons is described in verses six and seven, her marriage to Er. And notice the marriage that happens, verse 6. It says, Now Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. So Tamar now is Judah's, uh, what would we call it, daughter-in-law, I guess. Tamar means palm tree. And um, she also is a Canaanite. So you see what Judah is doing here. He's not only taking a Canaanite wife for himself, He's taking a Canaanite wife for his sons, born from his Canaanite wife. And so you can see the crisis that the nation of Israel is in. I mean, here is Judah, you know, the progenitor of the Messianic line, you know, doing this. And that's why this whole story is narrated for us. If God had not worked through Joseph, 
and removed his people geographically from Canaan, this is the kind of thing that Israel would have become. She would have become just another Canaanite people group. She would lose her exceptionalism. She would lose her distinctiveness. And had that happened, potentially the Messianic lineage would have been damaged as well. So that's why later on in the book of Genesis, when the nation is taken out of Canaan and brought to Egypt, it says over and over again, the the Egyptians wanted nothing to do with the Israelites because they were shepherds. And shepherds are loathsome to the Egyptians. And the reason that's a big deal is once the nation of Israel is in Egypt, now they're on their own. They're going to be incubated and left alone which cannot happen and was not happening as long as the nation of Israel was in Canaan. And so you can see through all of this why God is raising up Joseph. The Joseph story, as we've said before, answers the what question. Genesis 38, as strange as a story as it is, reveals the why question. Why a Joseph? Genesis 38 is a very important chapter in that regard. So the marriage there is given, verse 6. Now, Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now, Er, E-R, did not last long. Um, His death is recorded in verse 7. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. And we're not really told what the sin of Er was was. Uh, It's just the Hebrew word wicked. Uh, Wicked is, uh, it's kind of pronounced ra'ah. We're not told specifically what his sin was, but apparently it was pretty severe because God caused him to die. And this is the kind of thing, you know, that you don't really get at most churches today, the wages of sin. We have a tendency to kind of look at sin as, well, you know, I'll just do it and God will forgive me, no big deal. And we've largely lost sight of the severity of sin. Romans 6 verse 23 says, for the wages, which is a price, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, even in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is always a a wage. There is always a price tag of some kind when a person ventures off into sin. And that's important for us to think about because Satan is very, very good at getting us to think about the momentary pleasure that sin will bring, and it does bring that. It does bring pleasure for a season. He's very good at getting us to focus on that, the devil is, and at the same time, getting our eyes off the long-term consequences. This, I believe, is what happened with Eve in Eden, where it says there in Genesis 3 that the fruit was very appealing to the eyes to Eve. It It looked good for food. It was desirable to make one wise. And she took from it, and she ate it, and gave some to her husband, and he ate too. And I can almost guarantee you that when that sin transpired, the furthest thing from their minds was the consequences that that sin would introduce. In fact, the consequences were of such a severe nature that God is going to have to, in redemptive history, send his only begotten son to rectify the problem which is the ultimate price for God the Father to pay, sending forth his Son. If God has to do that, then the price tag associated with sin must be very, very serious. So Er, E-R, went off into some kind of sin, and it was severe enough where the Lord took his life. So Tamar and her marriage to Er, I guess, did not last very long. And then you come to the second son and his marriage to Tamar named Onan. The marriage is described in verse 8. Onan's sin is described in verse 9. And Onan's death is described there in verse 10. Notice, uh, first of all, the marriage. 
Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Now, this is a concept that's introduced here in the Bible that's sort of foreign to us, but it's the concept called Leverite marriage. It comes from the Latin word lever, uh, L-E-V-I-R, I guess is how you would spell that out in English. And that Latin word literally means husband's brother. This is a concept that was in the ancient legal system long before it was incorporated into the law of Moses at Mount Sinai. You can find it in a very early legal code that predates the law of Moses by about 400 years called the Code of Hammurabi. It later became a part of the Mosaic law that would be given centuries later at Mount Sinai. And sort of the idea is if a woman is married to somebody and she, he dies, leaving her childless, then his brother, her brother-in-law, needs to marry her and have children through her so the brother that died, his lineage would not be forgotten. It would continue on. Uh, Leverite marriage. You see it in the Code of Hammurabi. And later on at, at Mount Sinai, God brought into the nation of Israel this concept of Leverite marriage. You see it spelled out in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. I'll just read a few verses here. It says, When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So that's Leverite marriage, part of the culture of the day, Code of Hammurabi later brought into the law of Moses at Mount Sinai. That, by the way, is the whole basis of what is happening in the book of Ruth where Boaz marries Ruth, but he doesn't marry Ruth right away because there's someone closer, a closer kin, who was supposed to uh, take her and perform his duty of Leverite marriage. So Boaz did not marry Ruth until he figured out, does the closest of kin want to assume that responsibility or not? Because if he doesn't, then I'll be next in line and I'll marry her. Ruth chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says, Then Boaz said, On the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. So you may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. So this is how Boaz ended up marrying Ruth. So this becomes part of the Israelite culture. Now, flash forward, if you could, to the time of Christ. And it helps you understand a question that Jesus was asked by the Sadducees. And they really weren't asking him a question to get an answer. They were asking him a question to make him look bad and make him look dumb, which is kind of dumb to do to the Son of God. Okay, You try to make him look bad, you're really going to look bad. So here come these Sadducees. The Sadducees were a different group than the Pharisees, as we like to say. The Sadducees were always sad, you see. And the reason the Sadducees were sad, you see, is because the Sadducees did not, 
Well, first of all, they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in resurrection. They only believed in uh, the first five books of Moses. They didn't believe in anything else. And because they didn't believe in resurrection, um, they're trying, to, and they knew Jesus did believe in a resurrected afterlife. They're trying to make Jesus look dumb or look bad or look stupid. And they start to ask Jesus questions related to this Leverite marriage. It says there in Matthew 22, around verses 33, uh, actually 23 through 28. On the same day, some Sadducees, parenthetical comment, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him. Now, they're not questioning him because there's an honest search for answers. They're trying to make him look bad. They're trying to make it look, uh, make him look foolish because he believes in a future resurrection. It's kind of like dealing with some of my students um, when I taught at the Bible college. You know, a lot of them would ask questions, but you start to see pretty quick that they're really not uh, asking a question. A lot of them felt that their spiritual gift was, you know, stump your professor or something like that, which is fine. I can, I can be stumped, you know, but you kind of see through a lot of people, you know, when they ask questions, a lot of times people have an agenda behind the question. And that's what's going on here with these Sadducees. And the background of the whole thing is this Leverite marriage that I'm trying to explain. It says, on that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said, now quoting Deuteronomy 25, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brothers. Leverite marriage. A woman is a widow with no children. She's supposed to marry her brother-in-law. It says in verse 25, as these Sadducees are continuing, they're giving him this hypothetical situation. Now there were seven brothers with us. And the first married and died having no children, left uh, his wife to his brother, and also a second, and a third, right down to the seventh. Now, if they had asked me that question, I would have said, I don't know what the seventh guy was thinking. I mean, if the first six guys died, I wouldn't want anything to do with someone like that. She kind of looks like a black widow type of person, if you want my opinion. But... So he, they present this, this case to him, you know, all these brothers die. And it says, verse 27, Matthew 23, last of all, the woman died. So here's the question designed to make him look bad. In the resurrection, therefore, which they don't believe in resurrection, whose, li whose wife of the seven will she be? For they were all married to her. So she's married to these seven men who have all died, left her childless at the resurrection, which we don't believe in anyway. Um, which one is she going to be married to? And that's where he says you're an heir because you don't understand the power of God, nor do you understand the scriptures. Why do you not understand the scriptures? Because you, you, don't, you don't even believe in all the scriptures. You only believe in the first five books of Moses. And that's where he talks about in the resurrection, they, are neither, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels. And if you understood the Bible better, which you don't understand because you don't accept most of it, you would have an answer to your question. So it's not me that looks bad. He turns it around on them and they're the ones looking bad. But the basis, you know, for their whole question is this Leverite marriage. So heir dies and Onan is supposed to come in and he is supposed to marry Tamar to keep the name or the lineage um, of heir alive, so to speak. Now, Onan doesn't do that. What does Onan do? Verse 9. And this was where we get a little bit sexually graphic. Did you guys know that coming to church can be sexually graphic? 
Maybe that's why we have such a big crowd here today. I don't know. <laughs> it says Onan knew that, that the offspring would not be his. So I'd be keeping my, my brother's name alive, not mine. So Onan is sort of operating out of selfishness. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his so when, so when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed, sperm, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. So this is Onan's sin. Onan, when he had sexual relations with Tamar, when he reached you know, sexual climax, would not allow that sexual climax to take place inside of Tamar. The sexual climax took place outside of Tamar's body. A little bit sexually graphic. So I said to the Lord, well, how am I supposed to teach this? I'm a verse-by-verse -verse teacher. The Lord said, well, just read a commentary that talks about it. So, <laughs> so here we go. Um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum says, <laughs> uh, verse 9 describes Onan's sin. Onan knew that the seed would not be his. He knew whatever child um, he had would be the legal child of his dead brother. And it came to pass that when he went in unto his brother's wife, meaning he had sexual intercourse with her, that he spilled it on the ground, meaning that he ejaculated on the ground. From this account came the term onanism, and it's usually a euphemism. Now, a euphemism is a polite way of saying something. Onanism became a euphemism for masturbation. And so people have used this passage to teach that masturbation itself is a sin. So people will come to this and say, well, if you're involved in, I won't call it the M word, I'll just call it auto-sexuality, uh, then God is going to kill you. Um, I've, I've heard people uh, say that kind of thing from time immemorial, but that's not what's going on here. The sin was an autosexuality. Now, if you want to have a, a sermon on autosexuality, I mean, that's a good thing to talk about. Probably merits discussion. It's just not what's going on here. The sin was he wouldn't, he was using someone, Tamar, for sexual gratification, but he had absolutely no interest in fulfilling his duty under the Leverite marriage law. That's the problem. And uh, it says here, continue on, however, in fact, this was not masturbation, but coitus interruptus, meaning that he, he withdrew himself before ejaculation and spilled his semen on the ground. Now, you get the idea as you read this that he didn't do this once, twice, three times. He did this over and over again. He's using someone for sexual gratification, but he has no interest in fulfilling his responsibilities. Um, Onan probably would have done well in 21st century America because this is how people look at sexuality. Hey, they call it, what do they call it today? Hooking up, uh, friends with benefits, you know, all this type of thing. And it's this idea that I'm going to have sex with someone for the pleasure, but as far as responsibility... You know, fatherhood, paying bills, saving for college, not interested in that. But I'm sure interested in sexual pleasure. That's kind of what Onan is doing here, and he's doing this over and over and over again. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says his problem was that he was not willing to fulfill the obligation he had to his brother-in-law, and it says it there in the text, lest he should give seed to his brother. I mean, these aren't this isn't my line, this is his line. This was the sin. He did not want to honor his dead brother, so he obviously had hatred for his brother. He was willing to take Tamar for sexual gratification, but he was not willing to take the responsibility to fulfill his obligation. Now notice this last sentence. This was not just a one-time act. 
the way it is phrased means he regularly spilled his seed on the ground. So that's the whole context of this. So people that come along and say, if you one time engage in autosexuality, God's going to discipline you to the point of death, which I've heard people say. And that really is not the full meaning of what's happening here. This is dealing with someone that didn't want to take responsibilities for his sexual behavior, but he sure liked the sexual behavior. Pleasure with no responsibilities. And so Onan does this, and like Er, Onan dies. Look at verse 10. But what he did, what did he do? Sexual gratification over and over again, no responsibilities. That's what's displeasing to the Lord. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life also. So again, uh, this, you know, oh, I can sin and God will forgive me, no big deal. Look, I'm here to advocate and tell you that God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of grace. But there is always, always, in some manner, a price tag associated with sin. You can pick your sin, but you cannot pick the consequences of that sin. Sin is like jumping off the Empire State Building and just ignoring the law of gravity. And sure, I'm sure it's a lot of fun until you hit the ground. Then the cement tells you otherwise because you just violated a law that the Creator established that you decided to live in rebellion against. That's what sin is like. Sin is very appealing to us. It's very attractive to us because Satan is very good at getting us to think about the fun we're going to have traveling downward. But he doesn't tell you about what it's like when you hit the cement. So we're living in this society where people think that they can sin and there's no consequences. And by the way, they see it all the time on TV. I mean, you ever asked yourself, how come James Bond never gets a venereal disease? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we grew up with, what was it, Dynasty. I'm not proud of the, some of these series. Dynasty, Dallas, all of these series, you know, bed hopping. You know, I mean, no one gets a venereal disease in those shows. It just looks so easy. And so people see it happening on TV, and now they have uh, YouTube and anywhere you want to go to watch sin of any nature, particularly of a sexual nature, you, you can watch that. And you, you over and over again see sin, no consequence, sin, no consequence. And so people think that's how life works. Well, it doesn't work that way. God has laws. Now, those laws are not there because he's some sort of, you know, cosmic killjoy. The laws are there for our own good. They're there for our protection. It's like a, a child running near a cliff that's stopped by a guardrail. That's how you have to look at the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a guardrail. They're there for our protection. I believe it's Deuteronomy 10, verse 13, where God says he gives us laws for our own good. And Onan is violating a law. And God killed him. Er was violating a law. And God, God killed him. Now, Numbers 26, 19 will later say, The sons of Judah were Er and Onan. But Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And here's the record of their deaths. And then we have also verse 11. Tamar's widowhood. Verse 11, it says, Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought, this is Judah thinking, I am afraid that he too may die like his brother's. So what Judah does with Tamar after these two deaths, what he does with his daughter-in-law is he gives her specific instructions. Judah sends Tamar home. 
This apparently is temporary until Sheila, son number three, is grows up. You can have Sheila as your husband, but in the meantime, you need to go home. Now, Judah had no intention of giving Sheila to Tamar because she's a black widow. I mean, I've got two sons that married her and are now dead. Something, something's weirds going on with her. So you don't get son number three. But he told her that she got son number three. So he deceived her. And she, in turn, middle of the chapter, is going to deceive him. So she's told to leave temporarily until Sheila grows up. Judah caused Tamar or considered Tamar bad luck. Judah had no intention to marry Tamar to his third son, Sheila. And this is what's going to create resentment in her, which is going to come back and bite Judah because she, in turn, is going to deceive Judah. So this is the moral insanity that the nation of Israel is drifting into because of Canaanite influence. You know, my my dad um, always said to me, you know, we, we grew up Episcopalian. I don't remember much at the church as a young person, but I do remember my sermons or my dad's sermons that he taught to me in the 15-minute drive back and forth. I mean, that was some good, good preaching. I remember him telling me, don't let your friends pick you. You pick your friends. And show me who your friends are, and I'll show you who you are and who you're going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now. That's some pretty good advice. The Bible is pretty good about bad company corrupting good morals. It says that kind of stuff constantly. Go through the book of Proverbs, you'll see this. It talks about don't associate with someone easily angered because you're gonna learn their ways and become just like them. I mean, this, this is why God said to Israel, don't intermarry with the Canaanites. You think you're gonna influence them, they're gonna influence you more than you're gonna influence them. It's, it's like the law of gravity. I used to, and I won't do this today, but when I was teaching at the Bible college, I would stand up on a chair in the middle of the classroom and I would ask the person that's this, really the smallest in the class to reach up to me on that chair, take my hand, and pretend like you're pulling me off. And I'd always ask the students, is it easier for this little person to pull me off or for me to pull them up even though I'm bigger? Well, it's obvious when you see that, it's easier for them to pull me down because they have the law of gravity on their side. That's what it's like when we get intermingled in terms of very personal relationships, marriage, dating, business relationships with people that don't hold to your value system. The Bible is very clear that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. You have to interact with unsaved people constantly or you couldn't be in the world at all. You don't have any control over that. But what you have control over is are you going to enter into intimate relationships with them? Economic relationships, business relationships, you know, texting back and forth with someone that you're not married to or some kind of, you know, intimacy develops. Be careful about those relationships. Dr. Toussaint, after uh, having a career of watching so many of his students training to be pastors, fall into immorality in the course of their ministry, he told us one day, he goes, look, don't counsel, if you're a man, don't counsel women. Just don't do it. Because I've seen over and over again intimacy emotionally develop and that leads into immorality. Now, is that the rule that we follow here? Um, Don't counsel women? Not not, not necessarily. 
but we're pretty good here about how we have a policy that if you're a member of the staff, you cannot be in a room, you know, by yourself with someone you're counseling that's the opposite sex. I mean, that's kind of like a no-brainer. You always have to have that third person in the room. It's uh, kind of the same policy we have related to child predators. As you probably know, child predators love churches because there's lots of kids and lots of trusting people. Hey, can I uh, work in your nursery? Can I teach Sunday school? Can I do this? Can I do that? Yeah, but you got to pass a background check first. And under no circumstances are you allowed anyone, even if their reputation is sterling, around a child with no third person in the room. So if the wheels move a little slow here and, you know, we don't get all of these children's needs met instantaneously like people would like with staff and nursery and all of these things, that's the reason. It's a, it's a built-in protective system. Back to my father's sermons in the car, that's what he was talking about. Be careful about those circumstances. Be careful about that situation. This is why God has to move his nation into Egypt, where they're going to be despised by the Egyptians because they're shepherds for 400 years to protect them from this moral rot, moral deterioration that's happening here. And if, if God not worked through Joseph, what would have become of the nation of Israel? And you start to subtract from the nation of Israel, and now you're subtracting from the person of Jesus Christ who is going to come into the world through Israel. So wrapping up here, Tamar obeys, verse 11. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house, but she's burning with resentment. And that resentment is going to come into play with the whole story of Tamar and Judah a tremendous deception that's going to take place, which is in verses 12 through 26. And you look at that and you say, that's terrible. And it is. But did you know that God still works through terrible situations? I mean, it's not like something terrible happens. God is sort of handcuffed, can't use it. Because he is going to use it. He's going to use the worst of the worst. Because that union is going to create someone named Perez. Perez will be in the messianic line leading to Jesus. If you don't think God can work in terrible situations, it's just a matter of reading Genesis 38. And I bring that up because some of you in your lives, just by nature of living in a fallen world, have gone through horrible situations. Some of it we brought on ourselves, like Judah. Others are circumstances that sort of overwhelm us that are beyond our control. And it's easy to get despondent and just quit and say, you know, look at me, God can never use me or can never use that. Well, that's nonsense. We're, we're not promoting getting involved in terrible situations. What we're saying is if you've had a terrible situation, God is not handcuffed by that. He can and will use it for things that you can't even at this point contemplate. I mean, there's no way this crowd is thinking about a Messiah. And yet the Messiah is going to come through this sort of um, scandalous situation that's going to take place here. And so the kinsman redeemer, the next of kin redeeming, Tamar from bondage. Leave right marriage, kinsman redeemer. Her brother-in-law marries her to keep the brother's name alive. Do, do you see now why Jesus is called the kinsman redeemer? The next of kin who steps in to redeem a childless situation? Jesus is the ultimate kinsman redeemer because he became one of us. Uh, 
Ed Jones um, spoke about this in his prayer earlier, the God-man Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the next of kin to redeem us, and He's qualified to be that because He became one of us. At the point of the virgin conception, Humanity was added, and Ed Jones was very clear this morning in his prayer. Humanity was added at the point of the virgin conception to eternally existent deity. It's not like at the virgin conception, God took off one coat and put on another. He took off the God coat, put on the man coat. There's no subtraction, there's no exchange. There's an addition. Jesus has always been God. He always will be God. But to him was added humanity so he could become the next of kin, one of us to qualify to be our kinsman redeemer, which is why God is so um, concerned about this law being enforced. Because it points to Jesus. It's messianic. And so our exhortation for people today is, look, do you want to be redeemed? You want, to be, you, want to be per, you want your lineage purchased from futility, spiritually speaking? You want to be given the gift of eternal life, forgiveness of sins, promise of heaven? It's right there in the kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, the next of kin, who stepped out of eternity into time 2,000 years ago to bear a price that we couldn't pay to bear a consequence that we can't endure but he asks us to not work for our salvation which is the human tendency i'm going to make myself right before god kind of mindset same mindset adam and eve had in the garden of eden putting on their loin coverings no Our righteous deeds unto God are as a filthy garment. Acts 64, verse 6. You will not be made right before me through your own loin coverings. You will be made right before me through the finished work of Jesus who offers salvation as a gift and we receive it by faith. If a person will not come to God on that basis, they can't come. I don't, I don't make the rules. I'm just a messenger, just telling you what the book says. And so we exhort people to trust in the work of the Savior, even as I'm speaking. Uh, to trust in what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. That's the, the gospel. If um, anyone needs more explanation on this, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for these accounts in Scripture, even some of them that seem odd and strange. Help us to be good stewards of the full counsel of your word. Embrace every word, every line, every verse, every letter, every syllable even the smallest strokes of the pen, because these things have been given to us by you, and they're here for our understanding and benefit. Be with us as we continue our walk through the book of Genesis. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said. Pastor, would you please rise? I'd like to sing a song that Fanny Crosby emphasizes the wonder of God's grace to us. He loved the world so that we might have life in heaven.